So to start out, we'll be focusing FDM side only. So the FDM technology, as I'm sure most people are aware of, is you know is the suffused deposition modeling technology. Very simple at its core technology, right? Works like a hot glue gun, heats up the plastic, extrudes it out, cools off as it builds it up, and just builds up your part layer by layer. Um, this has a lot of you know benefits compared to a lot of the other technologies out there because we can make extremely strong, durable, functional parts out of it, which let us do actual uh, tooling examples with it in FDM instead of just doing it as prototyping or like fit and function kind of fit and form kind of tests. Um, and with that, with the actual end use uh, plastics we can use, we have a whole range, and that kind of depends on which level machine you get into. With the FDM machines that Stratus offers, kind of runs the gambit from the uh, small size machines like the Mojo, where the their small little FDM machine, small build chamber, print ABS plastic, and then you go up into the uh, U print, which is just bigger chamber, still ABS plastic. But even with these small machines, you can make functional tooling on them. Uh, from there, depending what type of tooling you want to make, we get access into the, uh, the bigger machines. We got the Stratus F123 series. Um, those are the new machines they came out with recently that can do ABS, ASA plastic, and also the PC ABS on the uh, Stratus F370. And they can also do PLA if you want to get to, you know, just rough prototypes of it. Um, but the machines that people really use a lot for the tooling is the uh, the production series machines, so the Ford 380, 450, and 900. Um, and these are because you get into the engineering grade and high performance plastics in these levels. And you know, these run the gamut from the other our generic ABS. And then we get into PC, uh, nylon, our high performance plastics for the alt, several different types of Ultem, uh, PPSF, the nylon 12 carbon filled. And a really cool specialty material for the uh, the ST130, and we'll get into that in a little bit. That's the sacrificial tooling material. So yeah, one of the big advantages is that you can actually use these actual like kind of name brand materials uh, in your end use machines. So you don't have to have a something that's similar to it, but you know, to the actual parts. So with manufacturing tooling, and there's there's a lot of areas where uh, you know you can. Be, 3D printing can be used in the uh, manufacturing process. Uh, we'll be talking specifically on tooling right now. They'll have some other webinars in the future about jigs and fixtures and other things like that. Um, but you can really cut down lead time, uh, tooling costs, and uh, you know, also go to things like direct digital inventory by not having to store you know, all used ones uh, sitting around just in case you need them in the future. Or if something breaks, you don't have to carry a stock of inventory in it. You just make a new one, and because the lead times on it are such drastically shorter, you don't have to uh, worry about it being down for a month or two, waiting for the new tooling to get made. So areas on the manufacturing floor that this can be used, I mean, it runs the gambit from uh, assemblies for, you know, things that they, they can be holding in process. This falls more into the jigs and fixtures kind of setup. Uh, quality control, where you, you know, need to hold something in a specific area while you're doing your probing it or other quality control assessments on it, packing and logistics for dunnage trays and just, you know, shipping parts around. You don't want things rolling off, shadow boxes, things like that for tools. Health and safety for actual guards to, uh, you know, cover a machine, so to cover pinch points, blades, things like that. You can just straight 3D print it. So if you have one-off machines or something that you're making yourself to be able to fabricate parts, you can make the health and safety requirements on it really easy, too, without having to have to custom fabricate some sheet metal parts or something to guard it. And also actual uh, end of arm tooling and other tools for the equipment being used in the factory. And we're going to be talking a lot about the actual equipment side of it with uh, some of the examples we're going to be going over. So, I mean, there's a lot of other areas where uh, tooling can pop up. So we're not going to have time to cover all of these, but we can see from the large array of stuff, it goes from, you know, drilling guides, hand tools, check tools, uh, you know, go, no-go gauges, uh, tool guards and the dunnage trays, kit boxes, holding devices, just, you know, runs the gambit where you can actually find areas to actually be able to uh, leverage your 3D printing technology. So some of the traditional toolings that are being used in the current methods forum are things like uh, thermoforming, which, you know, used for high production, you know, high volume, lightweight plastic parts where you can just form it over a specific shape. 
uh, metal flooring where you need to bend, you know, sheet metal into a specific shape to be able to use in something instead of, you know, milling it out of metal or anything. We can just form a thin metal part around it. We have washout tooling, also known as sacrificial tooling. These are really cool where you actually make a uh, part of, you know, some sort of ceramic or soluble core where you can then do a carbon fiber layup or something around it and then dissolve out the inside. And that leads to very, you can, for low volume parts, we can get really high complexity shapes without having to need any multiple pieces or clamshell joints or anything like that. And then uh, layup tooling, so where you have, you know, you can be turning to very large uh, tools there where you're making your big layups for, uh, again, carbon fiber, other resin-based applications. Um, and, you know, these need to be, you know, high accuracy, high strength. You're going to be doing a bunch of heat and, like, vacuum suctions on them to form it into shape. So that kind of brings us to a lot of the challenges that some of these uh, traditional methods face. So with uh, thermoforming, you know, it requires a lot of manual drilling of holes if you're actually making thermoforming tooling, once you make the actual shape tool out, then you have to go in and vent the whole thing to actually be able to pull suction through it to help uh, form it down onto the shape properly. Or with uh, metal forming, you know, it uh, can be a complicated process with long lead times. If you have, you know, the more complex the geometry, the direct relates to, you know, being more difficult and harder to uh, make that tooling. And with washout tooling, because it's a soluble material that you're making it with, that has a lot of issues with, you know, being fragile and brittle, unstable material that you're having to wrap your carbon fiber or whatever material you're using around it. Uh, and then that can have issues with shrink and curl, dimensional accuracy. And then our layup tooling, which can have issues with, you know, a lot of handwork when they're making it and, you know, having issues, uh, you know, meeting your complex geometries. So sacrificial tooling is a really neat one that has started out as a, a kind of a, a one-off thing that customers discovered that stratus side to uh, leverage more directly. So basically sacrificial tooling, yeah, is where you build your part up out of a wax or some sort of soluble material, do your carbon fiber wrap around it or something, and then you have to dissolve out or break out the inside part. And you can see like this kind of shape, there's no way it wasn't dissolvable or, or removable, it would just be completely stuck in there. So stratus, people started doing that meet originally which just with the generic soluble support material they had, where they'd actually print their part and they'd do custom infill geometries for the uh, support. That way it'd be really easy to dissolve and have a lot of good water food flow through it so it'd dissolve out a lot quicker and easier. Um, and they'd choose the standard uh, support material to build their parts with. So Stratus uh, decided to make a new special material, so the ST-130, that's specifically designed for sacrificial tooling, hence the ST in the name. But this is, it, it's just a stronger, more durable, higher temperature resistance material. So that's one of the issues when you're uh, forming up your part, you end up wrapping it and you're clamping at higher pressures and temperatures from the epoxy setting can cause uh, part deformation. So they have specific material to help reduce that. And here's a specific company, uh, Swift Engineering, with uh, specific parts they're working on. And this saves a lot of lead time for them. They reduced their lead time for making the tooling for this about to 90%. And, you know, part of this comes down to how many parts you're going to make because the traditional way to make this is that to do sacrificial tooling is you'd have to tool out kind of a, uh, an injection mold that you would then shoot with wax or whatever sacrificial tooling material that you can then do your layup around and dissolve out. So now you can skip that whole tooling process, step of it, and just print the actual part that you then want to... Uh, get your uh, shape made out of. And this kind of show, they went through a couple different iterations of this process. So once they make the part, then they sanded it down, they coated it in a release, so that way it would dissolve out, not attach to the actual um, carbon fiber when they're doing the uh, form of the part around it, and ended up saving, yeah, parts that can usually, can now build them in hours and days compared to it used to take weeks or months to get the uh, whole thing going, the traditional process. And this has been used in a lot of other areas, but you know, like uh, uh, race cars and automotive where they need lightweight one-off parts for air ducting and stuff. Uh, you can just 3D print the entire ducting and then you don't have to worry about uh, all the other steps just to get to that because you only need two or three of these parts anyway. Another area that's being used for tools is the uh, is layups where you're doing like your carbon fiber layup on a big outside form. So again, you know, big 
savings and reducing the time it takes to get it, reducing the cost it takes to get it, a lot of other things like, you know, increased stability on the part. And this example, people usually use a lot of the Ultem 1010 plastic because it's a very strong, durable material that actually also has a high temperature resistance, so you don't have any deformation, you have good stability, and a lot decreased weight on the core. I see on the, this example where the so Falcon for making, uh, you know, business jet um, they had a specific tooling they made. Uh, it took them 40, over $40,000 to have the tooling made up and 10 to 14 weeks lead time, and the thing weighs 150 pounds. So now when they could say, okay, well, if we change this design, make it for 3D printing. So, because the only thing we really care about it is that outside curved surface. We don't care what the inside core looks like and all those ribbing to hold it up. So now we're able to make it so we could 3D print it in, you know, two days. It weighs 15 pounds, costs $2,500, and just a massive time and cost savings. Um, and this, you know, just holds for a lot of those, uh, different technologies out there. And you do have to approach the processes a little bit differently. You have to, and usually it ends up being a benefit, but you kind of think outside the box and approach this as designed for 3D printing. Um, and that makes life a lot easier. So you're not taking, okay, here's our shape of our fiber reinforced tooling and just trying to print that thing exactly. You say, okay, well, we need this outside safe. Now let's redesign our part for the inside to actually make it 3D print strong, quick, and cheap. And you can really accelerate uh, your manufacturing process with this. Another example is uh, thermoforming molds. And this is something where uh, you can 3D print the whole thing. And this is actually a really big thermoforming mold they made. And you actually see on that top picture there, uh, again, they use the uh, Altem because it's the highest temperature resistance uh, material that they offer. And because the part was so big, they actually just printed it in two sections and then joined the part together, either, you know, lots of different ways you can join it from epoxy and glues to ultrasonic welding and, you know, hot air welding and stuff. And you see that kind of... Uh, saw joint gap going right down the middle of it so you can take, make really large parts. Again, drastic savings in uh, time and everything to actually be able to get there. And one of the things we can do with the uh, FDM technology is, you know, designed for 3D printing, we can go in and we can change the tool pathing for how it's actually being built, add specific little tiny gaps in our rasters as it's building it up so it has automatic airflow and everything going through it also. So now we don't have to go in and drill a whole bunch of individual holes in it to get the actual air suction. The whole thing can be porous and more optimized for what its uh, ultimate goal is. But, you know, it's really great, cost-effective for low-volume tooling. Another one is uh, hydroforming. So we can actually print out the tool to hydroform sheet metal parts around. And this is going to come down to a lot of it is how thick of the sheet metal part you're going to be forming around it for what type of material and if this can even handle it, right? So on, depending on what material you're running, they can withstand higher pressure ranges by just being stronger materials. So uh, by, you can reduce the weight, cost effective, you know, it's great for low volume stuff. Maybe if it's something like, okay, we're going to need 100,000 stamped parts out of this, probably go with the, uh, you know, machined out metal tooling anyway, because you're going to need that life out of it. But what this can also do is this can be a bridge to production. So as you're waiting, you know, a month or two for that tooling to get milled out, you can 3D print this part in, you know, PC or Ultem, depending on what kind of pressure ranges you need it to withstand, and actually start production on those while you're waiting for the uh, production metal tooling to arrive. So that way you don't have a lot of uh, downtime. You can actually get up and running a lot quicker with it. Or, again, if you just have low volume, just go straight to this, save time on how long it takes to make it, uh, and then how quick you are and how cheap to actually start cranking parts out on it. This is an example here of a uh, company that actually used an end of arm tooling. So, and it's also a good example for design for 3D printing. So ultimately all this part does is it, uh, it has vacuum suction going through it that it picks up a little sheet metal part inside a big water jet system, goes over, brings it under the water jet with a robotic arm, and then it cuts around the sheet metal specific pattern, drops it off, picks up another one, brings it over to cut. The part they used to have was just a big, bulky chunks of metal, a bunch of vacuum tubing running all around the outside to get it hooked together. They were able to redesign it, reapproach how they're going to make this, and make it, you know, cut down the weight dramatically, the labor to make it because you don't have a bunch of parts to assemble, 
and the uh, time it takes to actually make it. So with this part, that's the end uh, use part we can see in that picture. And there's one piece of vacuum tubing going into it kind of midway down it. And then it has its own tubing, like tunnels built inside the part that run down to where it's actually vacuuming up on the head. So that eliminates the whole need for all those other vacuum tubing running around. They print out plastic. It meets their you know, suction requirements because they it's not going to be completely airtight, typically, but you're pulling enough suction on. It doesn't matter if you have a little bit of leakage. And they ended up costing, you know, cutting the time of this by 85% and the weight by 90%. And when the weight's cut down, then you can move it around quicker. You can even use smaller robotic arms to move things around so you don't have so much overhead cost on that. And uh, they also, I believe, printed this out of all 10 plastic so that way it's uh, very durable. So even in a, an environment with the water jet going on, you splash and everything, um, you know, it doesn't wear down the tooling or anything. And I believe the, uh, another thing they did with this part is that because FDM can actually do self-supporting angles uh, with slight overhangs, you know, 45 degree overhangs without needing any support, they were able to print this entire part without support material in it. So that made the clean-out time, like actually from getting it off the printer and printing it quicker and cheaper because it uses less material, uh, you know, all increased on all those fronts by actually saying, okay, what if we design this for 3D printing and try and maximize every step of this process instead of just printing our part to use it, we can maximize other things like how much it's going to cost and how quick it will print. Some other tooling options out there that people have been looking into is uh, sand casting. So things like green sand casting, where you need like uh, match plates. Uh, this is a company, uh, the, the Melron Corporation, and they build all kinds of uh, you know door handles, window latches, and stuff. And there's lots of different types of door handles out there, you know, decorative ones, lots of designs. Every design they come up with, they you know have to make a match plate to be able to stamp it out into the green sand so they can cast it. Uh, traditionally, they were just having those CNC milled out of metal because that's what you do. Uh, so once they brought FDM in, the material they were printing with, I believe uh, PC, was strong enough and durable enough to stand the multiple you know, iterative uses of actually stamping into the sand. You know, and you can see it says down here the CNC part took $5,000 to make. The FDM tooling took $2,000 to make and you know, a week and a half versus uh, three to four weeks for the CNC. So it didn't take a week and a half to print the FDM part, right? 3D printers pretty quick. What that's also taking into consideration is that they needed a very nice surface finish on their part uh, for stamping into the sand. So once they printed it, they factored in, okay, how, how much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take to sand this down, polish it, get a really nice, smooth, hard, rigid surface on it? So when we stamp it into the sand, it doesn't leave any layer lines or anything. Even with all that factored in, it was still half the cost and half the and twice as fast. And when you're saving, you know, $3,000 per match plate and you have a uh, you know, set of match plates for every single handle design, you end up paying for itself pretty quick. Another really unique one would be uh, investment casting. So investment casting is another one where you can kind of get around the whole need for giant pieces of tooling. So the traditional way to make this is you would make an injection mold uh, you know, metal tooling that you would then shoot your wax into, and then you take your wax part out of there and you dip it in a slurry to make a shell around it. Then you can melt out the shell, pour your metal into there, smash off the shell, and then do it with your, and, you know, investment cast metal part. Um, and again, depends how many parts you're going to need to make out of it. If you're doing, again, 100,000 or something, it might be better, a better investment to make the metal one, but if you say, okay, I need 100 of these parts, um, it's going to be much cheaper to just 3D print that core so we can fit around the entire making the wax tooling step. And you can actually 3D print out the core and then print it with the FDM signal. It's extremely hollow, so it's very thin shell on the outside and a uh, whole lot of air on the inside, so it's very low material. And then when you do your dip it in the slurry, you pull the shell up, and then the interior ABS plastic will just melt right out uh, or burn out more likely, and then they just need to do a quick wash of the mold to get any ash out of there, and then they're, you're good to go. So we need to save months of lead time because injection mold tooling is uh, usually a fairly intensive process. Uh, so you save anywhere 70 to 90 percent on cost and, you know, 80 percent time savings, it, it's pretty quick. And again, 
So another thing you can do is uh, if you really want to get up and running with the new product line and you don't want to wait the two months for the tooling to come out, you can actually use this again as like a bridge to production where we can start uh, you know, cranking out some initial parts off the uh, printer by FDM printing them. And then once two months later we get our tooling in, now we can change over to using our tooling and already have parts out and getting sold. But that's just a really rough, quick overview of, you know, FDM and uh, tooling we have out there. And, you know, that doesn't even touch on all the other things like uh, jigs and fixtures and quality control, things like that that you can get into, uh, or polyjet or any of that stuff, or even really end use parts. And there's just lots of areas this can go into. But anybody have any questions about any of this or anything we can, you want me to go talk about further on or more than happy to answer any of these? All right, yeah, so if, uh, if there's no other questions coming in, then, uh, you know, just a quick rough overview of some uh, FDM tooling and things that people are doing with it. And if you want more information or more in-depth uh, demonstration or in about how you can leverage that, you know, feel free to uh, give us a call. All right, well, thank you very much, Tim, for putting the presentation together, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Hope everyone has a good rest of their day.